As I've already mentioned, I'm, uh, my name is Andrew Stackoff. I'm a platform architect at Pivotal. Um, today I'm going to talk about the CQRS in uh, modern applications and how uh, the pattern can be quite useful for a lot of uh, scenarios that you may encounter. Uh, <coughs> uh, but to get to CQRS, we kind of need to drive what is the need for it and, and examine um, the underlying problem. So. If you take a look at the uh, traditional model, and we've all been quite familiar with this architecture that is layered, uh, you know, we define this domain model that travels multiple layers, and it's supposed to encompass all our business know-how. Um, and this starts out nice and clean. Uh, we'll generally be able to map, build one service and map it to a, a requirement and then another service. But then there'll be a requirement that does this. And then you're, you're looking at that domain and trying to figure out how the hell do, do I map it to all of these entities? So you end up with this. <laughs> you end up with a, a really ugly SQL query and all of a sudden your domain model doesn't look so nice anymore. It doesn't perform, so you start optimizing it. You start optimizing using uh, caches and session replication and all of these technology know-hows. Um, but the underlying problem is actually on the right side. It's in your uh, domain model. Uh, the end result actually starts looking like this. So that big ball of mud architecture um, that you're all familiar with. And at the top of that, you have uh, the architect. By the way, I, I want to thank uh, Allard from Exonic, who helped me borrow some of these slides to prepare on a short notice. <laughs> um, so this architect's super proud of the, his architecture, uh, but you know he's still facing all these bottlenecks uh, and trying to improve it. So he goes on the internet and starts to research on how to improve it. And, you know, domain-driven design is a big thing, especially once you start researching microservices. Uh, so he goes and uh, reads the domain-driven design, and the basics of it will be about, you know, the concept of bounded context and how you apply the aggregate roots to represent your entities. Um, and the aggregates protect the integrity of our um, business domain. How many of you are familiar with domain-driven design? Okay, so mo most of you. Um, so this is a very familiar concept if you've ever read about uh, microservices. And it, it talks about uh, creating uh, ubiquitous language and uh, how you arrange the architecture of your application in order to uh, work around the complexities in it. <coughs> Um, generally, an aggregate root will have a collection of objects underneath it, but it is always retrieved as a, as a whole. It is used to enforce the business logic around access to a particular business uh, domain. And uh, we generally f uh, build repositories that store uh, that aggregate root in its entirety. Um, <coughs> so. He went ahead and read some of this, and uh, microservices, microservices all the rage. And we very often encounter this noun-driven design. So if it's a noun, it's a service. So we get order service, customer service, product service, inventory service. So instead of this one giant ball of mud architecture, we end up with teeny little bit mud architectures all over the place. Uh, but the microservices in this case hasn't actually alleviated the problem. They just actually spread it out over a larger surface area and, and in some ways made it more complex. Um, the other thing that uh, we often see is w when people start out with microservices is they'll uh, try to figure out how does the database fit in, right? So we'll have um, multiple microservices, are they all talking to the same database? Well, I need to do that join, how else am I gonna do it? 
all of a sudden we encounter issues like that, that database essentially became the bottleneck, right? So I have to plan my releases around um, that database. It becomes the integration layer. Essentially, instead of the API being the integration layer, now the schema uh, is the integration layer. So the, the architect's not happy. He, he goes back and researches some more and realizes, hey, I'm actually supposed to be doing this. Um, uh, sorry? Oh yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so that's microservice B. Uh, each one has their own database, but uh, now he's got a problem. How do I join the data between them, right? So uh, all of these questions start popping up. <coughs> so frustra frustration sets in. As, he, as we research some more, uh, the whole event-based microservices sets in. So instead of uh, you know, passing out uh, simple REST calls, we might be issuing events. Events is the new rage. Um, so I if we move towards event-driven microservices, it gets us part way there, but there's still an issue. If, <coughs> if another microservice wants to know uh, about ordered items, so let's, let's, let's say we have a shopping list, right? So we have an order and we, we need to know which items got ordered. Um, now it needs to understand all of these events that are being emitted by different service and how to apply them in a particular order uh, in order to drive the, the final state. So, so, so it actually, if it, if it wants to answer a question, which orders, uh, which items were ordered in a confirmed order, it needs to track um, that, that, and that. It actually needs to replay it to compute that state. That, um, and that contract is actually uh, implicit now. now. Now we have implicit dependency between those microservices because if this guy starts uh, changing the representation of how events are emitted, this one will be completely broken. And we've seen uh, uh, orchestrations that become much more complicated. Like, you know, we have order service <coughs> telling shipping service that the order was created, which confirms the inventory back to it, which then goes to payment service to figure out uh, uh, that th th we actually need to do payment, the customer pays for it. So all of these orchestrations are actually becoming increasingly difficult. In, uh, just by doing events uh, during microservices inside that um, noun-based microservice boundaries. Uh, and a lot of times when we talk to uh, customers on why are they doing it, uh, the, they're just trying to keep up with the trend. And, <laughs> you know, I've, you know, XML, Enterprise, Bus, Hadoop, the, these are all were trends at one point in time. And, and it, don't get me wrong, a lot of them are have their value, but when a trend sets in, it's uh, a hammer and everything looks like a nail. So we, we, uh, we have to apply them in a smart way. So uh, as part of my job, we often encounter teams that are doing this and we, we, we ask them, why, why, why are you doing it? And the core drivers is usually agility and scalability. Um, <clears throat> so we go back to the underlying concept. Why are you doing uh, microservices? And the, the answer is usually monoliths are bad. They're a big ball of mud in people's mind. But that's actually not the case. The big ball of mud it can be, uh, by the way, that's not always mud. <laughs> um, the, the, the monolith, a well-structured monolith, can actually uh, give you what you want and get you uh, very far down the line uh, before you actually f need to split it up. And uh, Martin Fowler uh, have uh, expressed the same. Uh, <coughs> Almost all successful microservice stories have actually started with a monolith, and then once they grew too big, they were split up. A lot of teams are trying to do microservices as a form of premature optimizations. And, um, you know, there's got to be a certain 
level of maturity before you start doing it. So uh, a lot of teams will start going directly this direction. Uh, they'll either completely fail or end up in uh, that shit grid. Um, what we see as a basis for a solid project growth is a well-structured monolith that once it gets to a certain size, gets split up over time and um, after it gets to a certain point, it actually starts resembling the microservices architecture. And everybody. So how do you structure a monolith in such a way that uh, is conducive towards being split out into microservices because uh, it's a lot of it comes down to architectural patterns um, and the key to that is location transparency so uh, being able to uh, group your uh, logic your logic by features and ensure that there's loose coupling between components in such a way that they don't care who they need to talk to from uh, a location point of view. The, and the key to that is all communication is driven through messages. So instead of directly invoking components, we're sending messages to components and we're relying on some kind of infrastructure to uh, deliver those components. When you actually start thinking about uh, components in such a way, uh, structuring your communication in such a way, it makes it very easy to pull things apart um, because now it doesn't matter whether it's running on the same machine in a different thread or uh, in a completely different process on a network. Um, and this pattern actually has a name. Uh, it's, uh, it's actor modeling. I don't know if you ever heard of it. Um, but the, 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 the actor system looks like this. So you have uh, basic units of work that represent your core logic and they accept messages that often end up in mailboxes and some kind of infrastructure is delivering it and feeding each, co each component those messages. Um, the, there's a lot of very successful systems that were built on this model. Er Erlang as a language, for example, uh, uses actor-based model. RabbitMQ, uh, be <coughs> uh, because it runs on er Erlang, uh, is highly scalable because of this model. So, um, the actor-based model uh, yields well towards uh, intro into com command query responsibility segregation. So that's what CQR CQRS stands for. And the CQRS pattern is actually very simple. Um, the key there is we're segregating the operations that uh, modify the state of our application from the ones that are uh, giving us some kind of answers about the, uh, the, the state of the system. So we are, we're segregating the right side from the read side. And um, the way we do that is uh, by passing events from the uh, right side to the uh, projections on the event side. Um, <coughs> If you think about how databases are traditionally structured, they, you know, the whole normalized schema, um, we're trying to optimize for both read and write. And in many cases, uh, that results in crazy joints, as, I, as you saw in the beginning, and it just doesn't work at scale. And especially once you start breaking things apart into microservices uh, or modular design, uh, <coughs> those th things start breaking down. So uh, there are three main types of messages in CQRS pattern. There is the commands, which uh, are type of messages that are sent to, to your system when you want to modify something. Uh, I want the system to modify its state. Uh, <coughs> they're generally handled by only a single component so there's only one receiver to them. Uh, <coughs> and as a, a result of applying a command, a number of events are issued as part of the domain model. So events represent something that has happened in the system. Uh, so events are distributed to all logical handlers that are interested in them. Um, so 
such as queries, and then you have uh, aggregators that capture those events and create projections out of them. So I can listen to one or more types of events and build persistent views. Like, for example, if in, in, in classical database structure, you would create a view that joins multiple tables and the database would optimize it for you. Imagine doing the same thing in code, right? So you're subscribing to uh, multiple events and you're creating a representation that now you can uh, query. The, the end result is uh, you can keep your domain model consistent. Uh, it, it actually represents what the business is doing and, and you can keep those aggregates as a whole. You don't have to add weird fields to it to satisfy, you know, oh, I, w when I query this, I need to actually bring in this field. So I'm gonna add this little weird field over here and populate it under this condition. And, and, and that often leads to like complete code smell. So by, uh, by implementing the system you, and segregating the right side from the read side, you not only keep the code base clean, but you also optimize for performance. <coughs> uh, so the, the general architecture would generally lo look like this. You would have UI issuing commands and the command would just be accepted. So there would be a validation happening on the command as it gets applied to an aggregate uh, and the UI would just be given a, a, an answer did it get accepted or not. The, the command would be applied onto an aggregate uh, <coughs> to generate a number of events and those events would be uh, persisted into storage. <coughs> Sorry, so there's, there's two ways. So you, can, you can either persist the new state of the aggregate or you can persist the events. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then the events get published onto some kind of uh, bus um, uh, onto the read side. To tie all of this together, you, you actually need three buses. And they're different because the, there's different semantics that apply to e e <coughs> each one of these uh, scenarios. So there's, uh, be because of the, the routing rules uh, differ. <coughs> For example, in a query bus, you may end up with a scenario where uh, instead of querying a single source of truth, you are actually uh, querying multiple. I'll give you an example. Uh, in a, uh, l l let's, say, let's say an online store, uh, if you ask for a price of an item, that price might be dependent on uh, who you are in the system, what kind of discounts are available. And those components might be uh, completely seg segregated. So you might actually get multiple components answering this question, this, the, the creating an answer to the same query, and then you're picking the lowest one of them. So uh, <coughs> uh, it, it forms a scatter and then uh, aggregate kind of uh, query response. <coughs> so the, the other important thing to consider in CQRS architecture is that events retain their value. Uh, <coughs> and uh, because they retain their value, it, it's often desirable to uh, store them beyond when they were just emitted. Um <coughs> Let me give you an example. Most systems are built around storing current state. So if, if I was doing online shopping and I filled out a shopping card, uh, you know, it might have <coughs> uh, the order ID and the items inside the, the, that I purchased. But my interaction with uh, that uh <coughs> card generated a lot of additional data. Um, I created an order. I might have uh, added something else in the beginning, like, you know, by the way, I, th th this is a real example for me because I actually did this. <laughs> I first was looking for new headphones. I went and picked um, Bose headphones and then Amazon presented it's like, hey, there is a, another type of uh, similar headphones on it. So I followed uh, that link, checked out reviews, found the review helpful, added that one and removed the Bose one. Confirmed and shipped. Look at all that extra information that I was able to capture. Now I can drive uh, analytics and telemetry out of my app and I can still answer all the questions on the left side, but I can answer a lot more uh, by persisting uh, what's on the right side. 
<clears throat> so um, the events would get emitted by the producers and captured by um, aggregators or projection side to create new representations as uh, we've already talked about. Um, the event sourcing pattern ag arranges itself into event streams. So event stream will be based around uh, aggregate type. So an aggregate might be an order or it's essentially it's an entity. Um, <coughs> Uh, of a particular business concept in your application and uh, or an aggregate route in this case and <coughs> it will have a an idea associated with it They're, they they generally always have an idea associated with it um, and as events are being emitted from that entity um, we arrange them in a sequence and that allows us to replay them in order to derive the current state or any intermediate state in between. So <coughs> um, this is very powerful because I can actually go back in time and look at the full history of how a particular aggregate evolves. <coughs> um, as you can imagine, if you generate a lot of events for a, sig a single aggregate, the computational power required to replay them becomes kind of big. Like, you know, it's, it's okay if you generate 10 events, if your aggregate generated 10,000 events, replaying them all from the beginning to derive current state be becomes kind of expensive. So the way you do that is uh, you create intermediate snapshots. So you create a snapshot of what your aggregate looks like at a point in time, and then um, replay the, anything that comes after it. In fact, you've already encountered this model pretty much in every database you deal with. You know, you'll have your data and then you'll have your transaction log. Uh, pretty much every database on earth built is built around event sourcing. <coughs> uh, <coughs> the other important thing to consider is that events are immutable. Uh, <coughs> the event is your source of truth and it never changes. Uh, what does end up happening uh, as your application evolves is um, the how you think about the event structure may, may actually change. So I'll give you an example. We, we actually dealt with this very recently with the uh, government of Ontario. We, we were dealing with addresses, right? So we had uh, two lines of address that we captured. Uh, and then they came back and said, well, we actually need to break it out into all the little components. And that, that's how we store it. That's how we think about it and there's additional rules coming down the pipe on how to do that. So what do you do with events that were already generated? So the way you deal with that is, is the same way you would deal with uh, your database. So you apply migration scripts uh, that can take original event version and upconvert it into the new state. <coughs> This, uh, this allows your code to target the new state, but if you are encountering an old event, it can actually be upcast into the new representation. <coughs> so uh, some of the event sourcing ben benefits is you'll get automatic audit for your uh, business domain. And this is actually a useful audit. It's not one of those, let's add trigger on every table in the database kind of audit and just store everything. Um, I've seen systems that do that. They're, they're only useful as far as checking off a regulatory mark. <laughs> um, the, as I've already mentioned, you can reconstruct the object to any state in time. And uh, the, the last project I worked on, we actually got a requirement uh, from business. It's like, hey, we would like to look at two versions of what, <coughs> you know, what was the version of my aggregate at a point in time and what changed between then and now. Uh, and at the time we, di we didn't actually use event sourcing so I ended up writing this really crazy reflection based delta comparator between <laughs> two trees. It was pretty insane. Uh, but if you have those events that are captured, I can just say from here to here, these are everything that was changed. And I can immediately drive that as my um, 
a comparison. <coughs> uh, the other. That's true. <laughs> so, so there's definitely precautions that need to be taken around uh, losing those events. Um, but, 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 but I mean, uh, the, the same can be said about the current state of the object, right? So if you, if you, if you lose it, you can be end up in an inconsistent state. Uh, I would almost go as far as saying that a lost event is much easier to reconcile than uh, if you're just storing the current snapshot. Because you, you, you don't know what the hell changed or, 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 or how. Um, yeah, you probably want to take frequent snapshots. Um, <clears throat> the other really useful thing out of this pattern is the ability to create compensations. So uh, we'll talk about transactions in a minute, but um, if you need to compensate for something that you did to the system and you need to undo it, if you have a clear record of what was applied, you can just apply it backwards. <coughs> uh, and the other interesting thing that comes out of event sourcing is actually you don't have to think about your schema from a database point of view because you're, uh, you're kind of dumping everything into a single table and uh, I'll show you what that looks like. You're, you're, you're essentially serializing these events uh, and you only get a few columns that represent um, everything you need to be able to re replay them back. You need your aggregate type, you need its ID, um, and you need the event payload. There's a few others, but at, at the core, that, that, that's, what you're, that's what you're doing. <coughs> So the, the other interesting thing that uh, comes out of uh, transactions, um, c comes out of this is the need for transactions. This is a very common uh, question that comes up, especially around people starting out with microservices, but this is not microservice specific. So like I if you're doing domain driven design, how do I apply a change to two aggregates as part of a single logical uh, com command? So, uh, the way you do that is using a concept called Saga. So Saga is a special type of uh, component that orchestrates a business transaction. It subscribes to events emitted by your business domain and um, it is able to uh, orchestrate interactions with multiple um, aggregates by issuing commands to them or emitting new events. <coughs> it's also able to apply compensation actions uh, in case something fails. So if I, in, this is a very common uh, argument I hear about microservices is it's like, hey, we're doing a money service, it has to be a transaction. Um, you know, it's the only way to do that. How, how, how would I do it without being a transaction? Um, if you think about it, it actually does, in the real world, Transactions don't work. They're, they're actually not there for most scenarios. Uh, if you send money from one bank to another, they don't have a common transaction system for you to, to commit it in both places. They actually rely on eventual consistency to uh, figure out, uh, you know, take money out of this account, send it over there. That, uh, I expect an event to come back here to confirm that it was deposited. If it doesn't come back within a given period of time, I'm starting a compensation process, right? So orchestration of transactions such as this is what we call a saga. <coughs> and uh, as an example, this is what it would look like. So, uh, you know, if you had a sales service uh, trying to talk <coughs> If you wanted to create an order and then ship it, you need to talk to a billing and a shipping service. A, so you might accept an order and bill it. A shipping process manager would actually need to um, listen to two events as an input and then emit a uh, command to the shipping service to actually go ahead and, and do it. <coughs> 
the other important thing in uh, architecture su such as this is uh, being able to define time-based events. So uh, a lot of times the trigger for, uh, for something that needs to happen is based on a timeout, right? So, so if I send something to you and haven't heard back in a given period of time, I need to emit a new message uh, to do that. So there's obviously need a need for a particular type of infrastructure to do that. Uh, <coughs> so the, the other thing to consider is that at scale, different rules apply. So how do you route all of these ev events to all your components and how will this scale? Uh, the answer is you don't and it won't. <laughs> um, a common mistake that actually ends up happening is all of these events are being sent to everywhere. <coughs> and uh, the, the key here is uh, the focus on bounded context. So, um, you know, a lot of times when you read about microservices, they mention that you should split up your microservices around the concept of a bounded context. And a bounded context uh, should be explicitly set uh, the boundaries within, uh, based around your team organization and physical manifestations, such as your code base, database schemas, um, and it <coughs> keeping things consistent within a bounded context. So within a context, you share everything, you share all events. Um, across context, ac ac across boundaries, you have to be very careful. So you, you, you want to selectively define what you're sharing and th this becomes a much more crafty API now. So instead of, for example, uh, sending you know, order created, item added, order confirmed, order placed events to everybody. I might just uh, publish order placed and anybody that's interested in it will come back and s send a query to me to get the order detail, right? So now, now that becomes a much more manageable contract between bounded contexts. <coughs> so uh, what is actually needed to, to do this kind of pattern? So. A, you need some kind of framework. Like these, these concepts are not simple and um, hand rolling them is good luck. <laughs> um, second thing is you actually need to an efficient way to uh, store these things. So storing of events has uh, a particular concerns to it. So A, you need to enforce the ordering of the events per aggregate and you need to answer certain queries. You, you, need, you need an ability to replay uh, events in a, you know, in an easy way. Uh, author authorization also becomes a, an interesting uh, concern to tackle because like who, who has access to certain events and certain aggregates and your uh, storage mechanism should be able to enforce it or, or <coughs> framework. Uh, and finally, how do you actually uh, manage the distribution of all of these messages uh, in, in, in your system? Um, <coughs> so what's actually out there to help you do this? So there is uh, a few frameworks. There is uh, Event Store, Akka, Lagoom, Jessa, Axon Framework. Um, there's two kind of lead contenders right now in the space, and that's the headliners are Akka and Axon. So Axon Framework has very recently released version four, uh, so they, they just call themselves Axon now. <coughs> um, the, both of these frameworks can do CQRS in event sourcing, but they do it very differently. Um, how many of you have worked with Akka or played with it? So, Akka is a very interesting beast because uh, a lot of what it does tackles infrastructural concerns. Um, concerns that generally are tackled by, uh, you know, modern platforms. So if you, if you put something like on uh, Kubernetes or uh, one of those systems, it, it actually takes a step further by, uh, building your architecture around actors and ensuring and enabling actor transparency. So where they run, uh, Akka will uh, 
create its own way of routing to those components, its own way of locating them within the grid, and, and it has its own messaging infrastructure. The, the big criticism around Akka has generally been that the logic, the business logic of the application it ends up being fairly heavily tied to the infrastructural components. And the, uh, that creates a number of complications. So number one, it becomes quite difficult to test it. You actually need to stand up the entire uh, Akka, um, what they call a system spawn all of these actors and actually send all of these messages uh, uh, within it. They, they have their own testing framework. Um, and in my experience, it hasn't been consistent. Like I've, I've actually ran into scenarios where test, test result would generate one thing and then I rerun it again, it would generate another thing simply because of certain race conditions that happened within it. Um, the, but, but don't get me wrong, this is a very capable uh, framework, uh, but it also requires a lot of learning curve. <coughs> um, the API is primarily base class driven uh, traits and access to static classes. Um, the other one uh, is called Axon. So Axon's primary focus is on CQRS. So Akam mainly focuses on actor-based model and CQRS and event sourcing comes as an extension of that. Oops. Um, Axon, its primary focus is CQRS and event sourcing and there's a very strong segregation there uh, in infrastructure components and business logic. Uh, they do have a pluggable architecture, so pretty much every uh, component of it can be replaced. It, it, it works well with dependency injection. Um, Akka does not. So Akka has its own uh, lifecycle management system for spawning components, so it actually doesn't play well with uh, DI. <coughs> and the API is primarily annotation driven. So it, it, because of that, it's well suited to be uh, placed in existing systems and to, <coughs> to be broken up over time, uh, whereas, um, with Akka, you might end up with like all or nothing. It, it's, you have to like move everything into it. Um, and it's, d it's difficult to break up system over time. So uh, Pivotal and uh, Axon <coughs> have been working closely uh, to kind of uh, create a reference architecture uh, that I'll show you in a minute. So. There's two other components that come to Axon Framework. So one is the, the stuff that sits inside your code, but they also have uh, the, uh, the tackling of the storage and the distribution. So uh, their two native offerings are the database side, they're called Axon DB and Axon Hub. The version four, these two roles are combined into a, something called the Axon Server. Uh, <coughs> um, because of the pluggable architecture, you don't actually have to use their products to do this. Uh, you can use RabbitMQ, Kafka for the distribution channel or pretty much any GDBC enabled database for your backend store. Um, <coughs> and it, it integrates nicely with Spring. Um, so Pivotal and uh, Axon have been working together to create a reference CQRS and event sourcing architecture. Um, and it's called uh, Axon Trader. How am I doing on time? Okay. <coughs> um, so Axon Trader um, is a system that we built that represents uh, what would normally happen in something like a uh, simplified brokerage service. So how many of you have traded stocks or one of those things? <laughs> so um, in... Uh, in trading applications, there is a, a lot of uh, concerns that are well suited for uh, uh, CQRS based architectures because they're difficult to tackle uh, uh, you know, using other methods. Um, so you need strong guarantees about uh, transactions, as I've already mentioned, something like a money service, you know, you, you need to 
make sure somebody has money before you can send it. Um, it uh, there's also strong guarantees about the ordering of messages, right? <coughs> so the the Axon trader uh, trader architecture looks like this. It's it's made up of three main artifacts. Uh, there's a trader UI which was built using uh, Angular. Um, then we have the main trading application. So this is the one that manages the interaction with the UI, and you can think of it as the API layer. So it, 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 it <coughs> and this one uh, manages the uh, the user's orders, the the portfolio, uh <coughs> and uh, excuse me. Uh, and the relationship between the domain model. The, the trader app actually interacts with a trader engine and this is where the, the trading actually happens. So, you, so if you think about it, um, in a uh, real world application, you would, for example, never submit your order to NASDAQ, right? You, you would always go to a brokerage uh, that would, whether it's your bank or uh, one of the more um, boutique ones, and, and they would then route your order to NASDAQ or NYSE and the, the, where, where trading would happen. Very similar architecture actually happens here. Uh, so as we accept um, requests from the user, uh, we need to do a number of things. So first we need to uh, validate that. <coughs> actually, let, let me take a step back. Uh, let me explain first how trading works because not everybody's familiar with the concept. So in a uh, trading applications, we, we have uh, something called an order book. So order book uh, is a sorted set essentially with two sides to it. So you have the buy, buy orders and sell orders. Uh, think of it as a marketplace where people are advertising uh, what they want to, to do there. I, I want to buy something at a given price, X quantity, and I want to sell something at a given quantity. The, the order book arranges them in uh, by price. And when an order enters an order book that um, is intersects with a, an advertisement on the opposite side, so if I say I want to buy something and there is a comparable match on the sell side, this results in an execution of a trade. So it results in trade events. <coughs> uh, this, this whole concept is uh, called an order book. So, uh, but besides the order book, we have uh, a lot of other concerns that we need to tackle. So, um, you know, as a user, I have a portfolio. I have uh, a given amount of uh, items, whether it's cash, whether it's stock, options, those are all uh, tradable units that I want to exchange for something else. Um, I I for example, if you go on a foreign exchange market, you will s often see a pair combination like uh, USD CAD, so that's your conversion. I'm trading uh, US dollars for CAD. If you go on the stock, I'm trading shares for a give, given currency. So for you to be able to execute a trade, you, you actually need to uh, have it in your possession, right? Whether it's money or a unit. So uh, <coughs> this particular scenario is, uh, is very useful for CQRS based and event sourced architecture because uh, if I need to submit an order to an exchange, I actually need to reserve the funds before my order can even uh, go there. I need to ensure that the funds uh, are allocated before it is sent for trading. And when the trading happens, those funds or units are swapped with the counterparty. Uh, does that make sense? <coughs> so, 
this particular application uh, highlights the <coughs> the two types of flow. So there is the transactions and there is portfolios. The transactions are based on the the transactions represent the uh, order management side, and the portfolio represents your inventory side. Like wh wh what do you have in your possession? And uh, you have a number of commands and events associated with these. So you, uh, when you submit a command for a given uh, state change, the platform will, <coughs> the application will issue a number of events. So I want to actually show you in code what this would look like. So, so this is what an. Oh. There we go. Um, so if I wanted to build an aggregate using Axon, um, the first thing I would need to do is create a class. Uh, to store this, th its state. We then tag it um, using an annotation called aggregate to identify it. And the, the name of the class essentially becomes the, the aggregate type. Each aggregate needs to have a field that acts as identifier for that aggregate. <coughs> uh, this is how the system will uh, be able to uh, reconstruct it from a persistent store. So for example, if, if a message is directed towards a particular aggregate, uh, w we need to be able to match them on, some, on something. And, and that's what the aggregate identifier <coughs> does. The aggregates themselves are well positioned to uh, accept commands, because they are the ones that are going to be modifying the state of the aggregate. So in most cases, you actually want to put the command handler directly onto the aggregate. And in this case, um, you can see they're just methods that we tag with uh, command handler. Now what this does is it allows the underlying uh, routing infrastructure to, uh, to, to essentially call this method when an event is published onto uh, the three buses that I mentioned. So, so when, it when a command is published onto a command bus, it would arrive at this aggregate. Uh, the way and as I mentioned, the way we know which aggregate it should be sent to is based on the uh, aggregate identifier. The <coughs> so as you can see, inside the command handler, we actually emit events. So the, the events are what modifies the actual state of the aggregate. Um, <coughs> It, it's a bit of a weird syntax because we call apply, uh, essentially republishing that event onto the bus. But what ends up happening is it gets picked up by one of the event source handlers methods. So th these are uh, methods that accept events and apply them onto the current state of aggregate. And the reasons we do the reason we do it this way is because when we are replaying. Uh, messages uh, from an event store, we, we <coughs> they the they get routed onto the event source handler. So um, there's two scenarios when an event might be applied. One is immediately after a command has been executed, <coughs> and another time when we want to reconstruct uh, a state of an aggregate from from storage. Right? <coughs> Questions so far? Yeah. Um, so. How do you evolve them? Like, do you have schema change? Like, how do you, how do you track schema evolution? So, for commands, commands are not persisted, right? So, you can just change them, and that becomes your contract. For events, they are uh, immutable. Um, Axon does have a mechanism for defining um, migrations, essentially. So you would create a, y you never change an existing class structure because you'll never be able to deserialize it again. 
uh, what you do is you leave it in place, create a new class that represents a, uh, that structure, and then you write a migration class that um, shifts that state. So when, when we uh, replay back and in, in, in an event is encountered in the persistence store of an old state, it would automatically be converted to the new state and applied onto your aggregate in its new representation. <coughs> So, in practice, your event structure will not change often because event represents something that happened inside a business domain. Um, so, the, the only time you would really want to modify your event representation is when you fundamentally change how you think about your domain model. So. I, I don't know, give me, give me an example that you, 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 you would want to modify it. Like, like an address change, for example, it, it still has the same, da same data. It's the same type of event, we're just structuring it slightly differently or we're adding new information. But, but at its core, the, the, biz the, the business stayed the same, right? We're, we're, we're just working with the data slightly differently now. portfolio you use 100 shares but there is split tomorrow but that is an event right that's not yeah, that that's not changing the structure of the event <laughs> yep. you need to go back and change all i don't so know it's well well, well, well <laughs> go ahead I say, what if what if i have like an event that like a user did something and the user is part of my event but then like what how I, what a user is Right, but but the uh, you're not attaching the user uh, information itself inside the event. What you're attaching is identifier of the user, right? So your ID wouldn't change. Your uh, the the event would really re capture just pointers to what it relates to 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 aggregates, and it would capture the the details of the event itself. So it's actually if you start thinking about it within the domain model, it's it's quite rare when an event structure changes. You, you might end up with new fields on it, so you might be capturing some more information around it, um, right? Sure, but like in, in a setup like this, is that not, does that not end up, so if you're not changing the original class because you won't be able to serialize, so you have to create a new class, and you're gonna have to create an actual transformation or migration, whatever you're calling it, between mm -hmm. A and B. Every time I add a field, I'm creating, I'm adding yet another natural trans transformation to that stack. So if I'm replaying from the beginning at some point, every event, at the, particularly the further back I go, is going to have a bunch of these natural transformations applied. And sure, they're cheap, because they're just essentially copying one, the fields from one type into the next, but I'm still paying the price of going through the, that process. Like, but do you create a like, new event stream? You basically have so 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 in practice what as I've, as, as I've said the event structure doesn't change that much and if you're adding new fields uh, the, the, this deserialization will still work right so it's if you have backwards compatible it, it, it's only really needed when you fundamentally s uh, change the structure of your event like like I said an address you know we had Two lines, now we're splitting up into multiple pieces. So something along those lines. Could you, could you version your events? Uh, well, essentially that new class you create is your new version, yeah. right? So uh, what I'm essentially trying to say is it doesn't happen very often. That it's, it's less of an issue than you think it is. And the, it's less of an issue because a lot of times when we change our schema, it's related to how we want to extract the data and that's the query side that's that's the um, projection of the events we we want to take some something that happened in the domain and create new shape out of it right we want to recombine it aggregate it project it that th so that is the query side 
OK. <coughs> so let me, how the hell do I get out of presenter? <laughs> Um, so I want to also very quickly show you the um, the database. The, the database is actually quite interesting to look at um, for this kind of architecture. So I have this domain event entry table that is actually storing pretty much all the data emitted from uh, my domain. Inside it, I have the event identifier. Um, I have the, <coughs> sorry, um, can't see that very well. Um, is that better? <laughs> Um, so, we, we have the payload, we have the payload type, um, we have the uh, aggregate identifier to which that event is related to, and we have the sequence number within that ag uh, aggregate identifier. So, if it's, uh, <coughs> let, me, let me see if I can find an example. So, right here you can see this particular aggregate called portfolio have uh, went from sequence number three to sequence number four. Uh, those are the two events that were generated for it. Um, and this this what allows us to replay it back. If we actually look at the structure of the uh, payload, Right, so it, so it captures the information only pertaining to that particular event type. Um, these events are uh, <coughs> then end up in on the query side. So on the query side, you can see we have these tables called views. Um, and the, these are uh, more of your uh, classic type tables that represent what the the questions that the user won't answer. They, they might send some kind of request, and they're optimized to uh, answer those kind of questions. The uh, query side tables are populated through um, components that <coughs> uh, capture published events. So let me show you an example of uh, one such uh, transformation. So we have this order book event handler, right? So it, uh, it subscribes onto order book added to company event. And then, it receives a number of events and then it works with uh, one or more repositories to create a representation out of that events and update those repositories, right? So this one is responsible for maintaining the read side based on what is published onto the event bus, um, as well as it defines the uh, query handlers, which are actually uh, the ability to, to, rec to answer query questions. So when, it, when something is posted onto the query bus, which is a question, this component will be able to provide an answer to it by accessing one of, um, one of these repositories uh, and just sending a message back. Um, the way you interact with uh, the three buses is by, um, <coughs> is by injecting them. So if we look at the query controller, for example, So I have my query gateway, which I've uh, injected into, the, into my controller. I'm able to submit a query to the query bus and then get a reply. The, the 
query components are able to answer those questions. Uh, this particular framework also offers a number of uh, unit testing, integration testing um, libraries to help facilitate this because it obviously requires new ways of writing your tests. Um, I think we're running out of time. Okay. Questions, comments? So one of the things that I think about SQL is let, let's say you issue a command mm -hmm. and um, it mutates some state, right? Mm -hmm. But let's say you place an order, but you have to return back to the user that this order was placed or this order was successful, and that should come from the read model. But there's this eventual consistency, and how do you bridge that gap between, like, when you write to the store and the restoring that data and yeah, so it, do, it does add some complexity to your application, but if, if you think about it in, in, in your classic architecture, what ends up happening is you're just blocking that request. You're like, you send that command and then you're waiting for responses, just like, you know, if, if, if it's a long query, it might be 30 seconds while you're not getting a reply. So your application is either frozen or it times out eventually. So you still have to deal with that issue regardless. Like for example, if the query timed out, but it actually succeeded, you need to kind of I issue a separate command to figure out did it actually take hold or not. Um, so the, the same semantics apply, they're just more hidden from you in a classic kind of way of doing things. But you're right, the, the, y you are dealing with uh, a race condition because of eventual consistency. So if you issue a command and immediately query, the results might not be available yet. So you, you need to think about that and how you structure it and possibly do um, a retry. Uh, the other thing that you may seriously want to do is uh, instead of polling, get that answer um, uh, returned to you as a continuation. So I, your UI might create a subscription to monitor a particular state of a query. So, so you can actually have query side that is not only like request response, but it's like, give me current state and all future updates on this. So in this way, I can subscribe to it and, as, and when the result is available, it will be pushed down to my UI and become available. Um, and, and that's probably a better way of thinking about it. With, with the use of WebSockets and um, similar push technologies, you, it's not that difficult to do.